Well, again, welcome to, to First Christian Church for Sales. We are ending up a, a short little message series called Led by the Spirit. Uh, it's part of our annual giving campaign. If you're on our mailing list, you would have received a pledge card. If, you, if you're not or you didn't get one, they're in the back. You can grab that on your way out if you'd like to uh, contribute financially to our church over the coming year. That's how we plan and, and be wise stewards of our money here as we look ahead for 2023. Um, we'll accept those beginning next week or, or earlier, but that's when we're hoping we'll get most of them in. But today I want to talk about something that probably impacts all of us to some degree. I know it impacts me for sure. Uh, we're going to talk about chasing money and material stuff in this world. And before we dive in, I just want some help from you and ask you a few questions because it's not very much fun without your interaction. How many of you would say, honestly, you wouldn't mind being rich? Like, is there anybody who wouldn't want to be rich? Okay, I think we all would love to be rich, right? Um, how many of you would say that you know someone who is rich? Anyone know some, you know some people who are rich? Okay, now, now I'm wondering again, have you ever looked at someone who's rich and thought to yourself, if I were rich like they were rich, I would be better at being rich than they are at being rich? Right? Like you go, what, what are they doing with that stuff, right? And so I think we could do it better. Now this is a more difficult question, and we're curious to see how you answer this one. But uh, how many of you would consider yourself rich? Okay, see, if you're here two weeks ago, you're like, yeah, we already talked about that. So some of you either didn't remember or you weren't here, and that's fine. Didn't see as many hands go up. But this is what I know. I know that, that most of us said we're not really rich, but we'd love to be rich, right? And like so many people in this world, we like continue to pursue or long for, even lust for, more money and more stuff, like if I could just have a little bit more. I found this article from a few years ago that talked about what people would do for $5 million. Have you ever thought what you'd be willing to do for $5 million? Um, according to this article, well, let me ask you this question. How many of you would be willing to only listen to country music the rest of your lives for $5 million? I'm not a big country music fan, but for $5 million, I can see myself going down the road, listening to Honky Tonk in my new Porsche right? I'll be okay with that, okay? 54% of Americans said they would do it. I thought that was a little low. I was kind of surprised. Here's another interesting one. How many of you would have all your teeth removed for $5 million? Yeah, absolutely. Abe, you and I are the only ones. I mean, for a couple hundred grand, I could make them all gold and look better, right? I mean, we'd still have like a lot of money left over. That's interesting. Okay. Well, 42% of Americans, like we're in the 42%, apparently everybody else. Now, this one was a little disturbing to me because I would never do this. 50% 50 about half the people said for $5 million, they would allow one random person on earth to die. That's all. I think that's awful, personally. Um, uh, here's another one that I, I had a tough time getting my head around. 24% of people said they would live in absolute solitude for the next 20 years for $5 million. I could not do it. Okay, I'm too much of an extrovert. However, I know some of you well enough, you would pay $5 million <laughs> to be left alone, right? So anyway, Gallup did this poll, and they interviewed a lot of people to find out what is rich. In other words, in our country, if you want to be at rich, at what point will you know that you're there, right? And like, when, when will you have enough money to say, yeah, I'm, I'm finally rich? And what's interesting is that the response varied according to how much people already made per year. And so like people who made $30,000 a year, the, their average response was that they would need to make $74,000 a year to feel rich, like slightly over doubled their income. Uh, you know, and I know a lot of people who make, you know, like $74,000 a year and they're not like, I doesn't feel rich to me, right? And then or a lot of Americans who make about $50,000 a year, they responded that it would take $100,000 a year to feel rich. And again, I know some people like in that range and they've got two kids in college and it's like, like, uh, I don't really feel rich, right? And so what's fascinating to me though is that it, they asked the top income earners, people way into the six figures, what it would take to be rich and the average response was $5 million in assets. Then you're rich. Like, poor Joker has only got $2 million in assets. You know, he doesn't, he's not rich, right? Of course he's rich. <laughs> but, it's, but they don't feel rich in our culture. And so what I know about you is that you don't feel rich, but you want to be rich, and so what do we do? And so like many of us, like we live with this continual pursuit for more. And so what is rich? Like rich is a moving line. 
And I bet there are many of you that are like me. It's like, what do you need to be happy? What do you need to feel rich to be satisfied in life? And most people would say, I'm not quite sure what that target number is, but it's a little bit more than what I have now. And that's why Jesus talked about having a right perspective on money and things. In fact, in Luke 12, 15, if you want to follow along in your insert, this is what Jesus said. He said, watch out. Like if you weren't paying attention, he says, be on your guard. Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. In other words, Jesus says, the quality of your life isn't measured by the volume of your stuff. The quality of your life isn't measured by the volume of your stuff. So be on your guard, be very careful, because everything in culture is shouting at us. You need this, you need more. Again and again, the dominant message like we hear from culture is that what we don't have is what we need to be happy and fulfilled in life. What you don't have, that's what you need. You know, that, that's what's missing. And that's why Jesus said you have to be on your guard. Your life doesn't consist in an abundance of stuff. And then later in chapter 12 in Luke, he tells this story about a guy who had a great harvest, like this bumper year of crops. And this guy asked, like, what, what am I going to do? Like, here, I've got all this money coming in from all these crops. And the guy says, I know what I'll do. Like, I'll tear my barns down and I'll build bigger barns and then I can retire early. And, you know, I'll take this, I'll take the, like, I'll have an easy life at that point, and I'll throw a lot of parties. And this is what God eventually says to the rich guy in verse 20. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus finished the parable saying, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And here's what's fascinating to me about the story is that God wasn't mad at him for being rich. Think about it. He was a farmer who made him rich. Like God did, right? God gave him a bountiful harvest. God was disappointed because he wasn't rich toward God. He was only rich in the things of this world, but he was missing being rich in the things that matter most. And so with that in mind, I want to tell you some good news and some bad news. The good news is this. Don't miss it. The good news is you're rich. Did you know that? You are rich. You don't feel rich. I know that. Some of you have more bills than money. But when we get a little bit of perspective and we recognize that around 3 billion people in our world today live off $5 or less each day, and some of us spent $5 on coffee this morning, then we realize we're rich, right? Like it starts to put it in perspective that based on, on, on where most people live in the world, we actually are very rich people. In fact, you can tell how rich we are by the things that upset us. Like when we get really mad because our fast food order as we drove through the drive-thru didn't give us our dippy sauce for our nuggets. How could, dare they? Service is getting terrible in this country. It's like, you know, that someone else prepared for us. Or, or Netflix won't connect to the Wi-Fi. Oh infuriating. So you can tell how rich you are based on what bothers you the most, right? And so, and so when I try to step back and think about it, that I can play any song in the world basically on my devices, I can stream pretty much any movie, play games. I mean, if we can drive a car, if you own a car, that puts you in the top 15% of the wealthiest people in the world. And so if we drive our car past 10 other restaurants to go to our preferred restaurant to have someone else who milks the cow or caught the fish or cut the head off the chicken. I know that's graphic, but evidently that's what you have to do to get chicken salad. Someone else does all that and they cook our food and they clean everything and they prepare our plates and they deliver it to us and they put a little garnish on it too just for a bonus and then we complain about it because it took seven minutes. I'd say we're rich. How about you? And the good news is we're really rich. Like I know that right now that there may be some people who are facing extreme financial situations, you know, medical bills, a divorce, you know, a single parent that's struggling to, to stay in their apartment. I don't want to diminish the reality maybe of some of your experience right now, but overall, the vast majority of us are actually doing okay. We're pretty rich by this world's standards. 
And if we're going to acknowledge before God that he's actually blessed us, that compared to most people in the world that were really rich, then what I want to do is I want to be good at being rich. Like I want to be rich in a way that honors God. So in order to be good at it, first we have to acknowledge it. And so I'd love for you, if, if you believe it, don't say it if you don't believe it, but if you believe it with me, just say, I'm rich. Right? Now maybe with a little more gratitude, like, because we're rich, like we've been blessed by God, so say it with a smile, I'm rich. Like my God has blessed me, I'm rich. And so if, if for a moment you feel a little bit uncomfortable saying that, like you don't want your kids to hear that, or I feel a little guilty saying it, if for any reason you feel uncomfortable saying I'm rich and you believe it, I want you to ask yourself why you would feel uncomfortable. Why would you be a little bit embarrassed? I love what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5.19. He says, Moreover, when God gives someone wealth, who gives wealth? Our God gives wealth, but I'm a self-made man. You know, actually, God made you first, right? And you have gifts, and you have talents, and you're born in a place where we have more opportunities. I mean, you didn't do all that yourself. Give God some credit. When God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, what is it? This is a gift from God. And so if for a moment you feel embarrassed or apologetic or ashamed, ask yourself, in what other area of life are you blessed and embarrassed by the blessing? Right? Like if you're married and you have a great marriage and someone says, man, I just, I love, I love, you have a great marriage, you know? You don't say, oh no, not really. She's pretty difficult. You know, you better not say that, right? Or I'm difficult, right? You better not say, you know, oh, I love your home. Well, yeah, but we've got a leaky root. You know, you just say thank you, right? Because you probably have a beautiful home. They wouldn't be making that stuff up. And that's the good news is that we're rich and we shouldn't be ashamed of that. But there's bad news too. The bad news is you're rich. The bad news is you're rich. And being rich puts us at a spiritual disadvantage. In fact, Jesus had a conversation with a rich young ruler and his money and stuff was so important to him that it hindered him. It kept him from becoming a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And so the good news is we're rich, we're blessed. The bad news is we're rich and it's a tremendous disadvantage spiritually. Why? Because we already have a roof over our heads, right? We, we already have food in the pantry. We can buy, you know, I mean, not whatever we want. We may not be that rich, but we pretty much get what we need or want. And we've probably never had to pray to God literally, give me today my daily bread. Because we've already got a pantry full of food and we missed out on seeing God provide for us. It's also a disadvantage because we're so distracted. Like, we have rich people options and rich people opportunities and we're so rich and blessed with these opportunities that we're overwhelmed exhausted we often miss out on what matters most and if you don't believe me you know just go to some developing nation like on day one you'll be shocked you know your, your stomach will turn at the extreme poverty you won't believe what you see and you'll feel so much sorrow and so much compassion for these people and then on day three or four you'll suddenly realize that like, they have something we don't have. Like, they've got time with people, and they've got relationships, and they often have more intimacy with God. And what they don't have that we have in terms of stress and anxiety and the burden of managing our stuff. And then on day five or so, like, you find yourself a little bit jealous of their simplicity and their love for one another, and their appreciation of community, and their adoration for God. It's a disadvantage sometimes to have so much stuff. Another reason it's a disadvantage is this, because to whom much is given, much is required, expected. You fill in the blank. Those are all good words. In other words, it's great we're rich because we truly can enjoy what God has given us, and that honors God, but God also expects more, and because we're rich, we have a greater responsibility. 
And all the time we're rich, every moment of every day, like culture shouts at us, what you don't have is what you need. The newer phone, the bigger TV, the brand new purse, the shoes, the watch, the sunglasses, the wallet, the jacket, the backpack, the speakers, the car, the flooring, the furniture, the countertop, all the accessories that are out there, the artwork and vacations, because what you don't have is what you need. And that's why Jesus says, be on guard, be careful. Because a person's life, what really matters, doesn't consist in the abundance of money and stuff. And, and we all know this in our heads, right? Like, this isn't really new information. The problem is, is that our lifestyles often don't reflect that truth. And if we're really honest, you know, some of us would say, yeah, I'm spending more than I make. Because there's this pressure to get all this stuff. And so I've bought into this lie that more really matters. And if I just get that, then I will finally be happy. And the very way that most of us live in this culture today says what we really believe is that more stuff will make us happy. And so here's what we have to understand. Whenever we believe that lie, and it comes at all of us all the time, every day, in every way, whenever we believe the lie that more money, more things, more stuff, that's truly what we need to be blessed and happy, we have to recognize that we're under the curse of money. That whenever we believe that our problems can be solved by more stuff and more money, we're under the curse of money. But what I hope you'll understand is this, more money isn't going to keep your kids off drugs. In fact, more money may put them in a place where they're more susceptible to drugs. More money is not going to heal someone who is sick with cancer. More money will not make your depression go away. More money will not save your marriage. What we don't need is more of what's temporary. What we need more of is that which is eternal. So what we need more is, is more Jesus. More Jesus. Like, I don't want to be under the power of something of this world. I want to be under the power living in the blessings of the eternal world, living a life that truly honors God. And that's why I love what Paul told Timothy. He's mentoring this young guy, trying to lead him along into something that's better. And Paul's telling him to talk to the rich people. And when he's talking to the rich people, he's, he's talking to you and me. And so hear this is God's word to us. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope where? In God. Who does what? Richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In other words, don't feel guilty when you're rich. God, God gives it to you. God blesses. He's a good God. He loves to bless his children. When you are faithful with a little, you know, God may bless you with more. Some of you, you've been really faithful. You've taken what God gave you and you've stewarded it and you maximized it and you multiplied it and it's a blessing. It's from God. Don't feel guilty, but do feel responsible. Do feel responsible. Because God's blessed you and it's not all for you. You have every right to enjoy it. You have every right to a nice you know, place and a nice car because God's blessed you with it. But it's not all for you. To whom much is given, and that's most all of us, much is expected. And that's why God's word to us rich people is this. He goes on, command them to do good, to be rich in what? good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Why? So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So they, they might enjoy the depth of the blessings and the goodness and the character and the nature of our good God. And so be generous, be willing to share, be rich in good deeds so you can take hold of the life that's truly life. See, God's blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich, but, but I'm not going to trust in my riches, but in him who richly provides. And because I have more, I'll give more and do more. And that, that statement's in your, in your notes. I hope you can say that for yourself. I thought about like having us all say that, but I thought, you know, maybe some people just aren't really ready for that. Maybe you need to process that and say that on your own. It's really good news. 
We're rich and blessed. But it can also be bad news because it can be distracting. It can be a spiritual disadvantage and more is expected of us. And so I don't know about you, but with everything in me, I I want to live this. My God has blessed me with more than I need, but I will not trust in stuff but the one who richly provides. And because he has given me more, I am called and equipped and empowered and honored to give more and do more. See, the temporary things of this world promise, but they never deliver. And you know it, because when you you get that new purchase, I mean, it feels so good, doesn't it? And then it's like, you know, two years later, it's in your closet. So let's do something that matters. Let's, let's do something that's, that, that lasts. Let's make a difference like only rich people can make a difference. Let's take what's been given to us and let's use it to bless others. And, and so maybe you'll help you know, pay your friend's rent anonymously to be a blessing. Maybe you'll grab some boxes and give a whole day helping someone move. Maybe you'll serve in one of our you know, outreach ministries or one of our local uh, mission partners. Or maybe you, you'll give of your time to help with children or youth or in the music or media ministry here at church. Maybe you'll take some vacation time to go on a mission trip to Haiti when it's safe again or with a work team here at FCC to help a family whose property got destroyed by a natural disaster. See, one of the most shaping moments that I've ever had was on one of my trips to Haiti. Uh, If you've never been to a place that has no electricity, no running water, barely even shacks to protect themselves from the elements of of this world, it's jarring, and it helps you to see just how rich you are. And on my second trip to Haiti, I got the privilege of, of going to Mayette. That's our, our sister village. It's a really small village. And they've got a church there and a school there, and um, we sponsor the school. And uh, I got to visit one of the elders' homes, and, and they had a table in their very modest house. You know, it was a one-room house, basically. And they had a table and two chairs, and I didn't think either chair could handle my weight. Okay? Not so much that the chairs were that bad, but in Haiti, I'm like one of the biggest guys around. Okay? And so I was nervous because I didn't want to break their chair, and they, but they insist, you've got to have a seat, you've got to have a seat, Pastor. And they brought out some bread to share with me while I, like, I was talking with them through a translator. They don't know English. And so the wife handed me the bread to eat, like for a snack. But here's what I already knew about them. That this bread is really, really valuable. Most Haitians survive on one meal a day. Some, some get two meals a day. But my trans, my, and I didn't want to accept it, but my translator said, you must eat it. Like, do not dishonor and steal from them their joy of generosity. And so I did, I did the best I could, like through tears, to express my gratitude to her gratitude to her, and then she said something back to the translator along the lines of, I am the richest lady in my community because I have the honor of blessing a man of God with bread. And Jesus says, watch out. Your life does not consist in the abundance of stuff. I don't know about you, but I'm blessed. I'm rich. My God has blessed me with more than I need, but I will not trust in my riches but in him who richly provides. And because we have more, we will do more and we'll give more. And in that, we will find the life that's really life. And that's how to be rich in a way that honors God. Let's pray. Father, today we ask that you would help us feel the honor of your blessings, the joy of enjoying what you've given to us. It comes from you. And at the same time, God, help us to feel the responsibility to use it to make a difference in the lives of people in this world. Lord, for those who may give for the very first time to you through the church, bless their gift today. God, for those who may use their time to serve as only rich people can serve, may they find joy in pouring out their lives for others. And God, I pray you'd give us eyes to see opportunities this week to do good, to be generous, and to truly find the life that is spiritual life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.